Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panel uh, this afternoon uh, on religion in three continents, exploring uh, Jewish lives and interreligious relations in Europe, Africa, and uh, the Middle East. Um, this is a panel uh, hosted by the Cambridge Interfaith Programme. We are an interdisciplinary uh, research centre in the Faculty of Divinity, researching the relations between religious traditions, primarily from uh, Jewish, Christian and Muslim perspectives. And we have three speakers today from the Cambridge Interfaith Programme, offering different perspectives from different academic disciplines on Jewish life and identity in different parts of the world bringing together perspectives from social anthropology, uh, music and ethnomusicology, uh, and from history and philosophy. And the study of any given religious group often entails thinking very carefully about community boundaries and how these communities that we're studying interact with the wider societies of which they're a part, and of course with other religious groups within those societies. Um, just to say a little about the format of our session, uh, we'll have three um, relatively short presentations from uh, our, our speakers, and then we'll have uh, a good amount of time for uh, Q&A for the panelists to engage with one another and also to take questions uh, from you. So do please um, send your, your questions in uh, via the um, Q&A function on, uh, on Zoom. Um, before going into um, the very first of our presentations, I'm just going to hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Daniel Weiss, to say a little more about um, Jewish studies at the University of Cambridge. Daniel. Thank you, Giles. Yes, so um, this is a, a very exciting session because it's uh, it owes its existence to current efforts that we're uh, undertaking to establish a cross-faculty center for Jewish studies at the University of Cambridge. And as you'll hear in the session, we have presenters coming to Jewish studies, uh, topics from different faculties, different methodologies, uh, but I think you'll find uh, a lot of interesting resonances between them. And uh, this is uh, very much the point of these current efforts. Uh, we're seeking to increase both the visibility and accessibility of relevant uh, Jewish studies research and teaching across the university, uh, not only for students, but also for alumni and other interested audiences. Uh, and this is also, uh, this effort uh, it, it involves uh, the Cambridge Interfaith Program, of which all three of the uh, presenters are involved in. Uh, and so we, this, uh, the interfaith element and the Jewish studies element are going to be highlighted for you today. Uh, and with that, I'll give it back to Giles to introduce our first speaker. Wonderful, thank you uh, very much, Daniel. Um, so our first speaker this afternoon uh, is Dr. Anastasia Bader, um, who's actually our most recent uh, uh, arrival in um, Cambridge Interfaith Programme. Um, she joined us uh, just this last summer, uh, having relocated from Luxembourg, uh, where she spent time uh, observing and researching the interaction between two religiously distinct Jewish communities and uh, non-Jewish uh, residents in Luxembourg. Uh, and before her time in Luxembourg, uh, she spent time studying Jewish communities in uh, New Zealand. I, I don't know how much she's going to talk about New Zealand today, but we could actually uh, build this as uh, um, four continents rather than three. It suddenly occurs to me, but uh, uh, there we are. Uh, so, uh, Anastasia, I'll hand over to you. Great. Thank you, Giles. I'll just share my slides. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as Giles said, I'm Anastasia Bader. Um, I've just joined the Cambridge Interfaith Program in the Faculty of Divinity this past summer. Um, I'm an anthropologist, but like everyone on this panel today, my work also really sits within the realm of Jewish studies. Uh, as Giles said, I've worked mostly with contemporary Jewish communities in New Zealand uh, and in Europe. And today I wanna share a small piece of some of my recent work with Jewish communities in Luxembourg. Um, so I'll just start with a little bit of background on Luxembourg. Um, so it's a very small country uh, between France, Germany, and Belgium. It's very international. About half of the people who live and work there aren't actually from Luxembourg. Uh, it's also a historically very Catholic country. Um, and there's always been a very intimate relationship between the state and its local religious communities. 
But just a few years ago, uh, the government decided it was time to secularize. So they stopped uh, catechism classes in schools. The state began to taper off its funding to its religious communities. Um, and they instituted things like a ban on face coverings in certain public spaces, certain kinds of full coverage swimwear, um, all, the, all the things that you sort of might expect uh, based on what its neighboring countries have been doing uh, in similar veins. But at the same time that all of this was happening, the Jewish community of Luxembourg was undergoing its own internal changes. Um, so it's always been a relatively small community. And since the 1960s, there's really only been two synagogue congregations uh, in Luxembourg, one in the very center of the country, one in the south. Um, historically, both were Orthodox, uh, both Ashkenazi, both very Luxembourgish, um, and both overseen by a single sort of administrative board called the Consistoire and uh, led by a grand rabbi. Um, but for a long time, the synagogue community in the south had been getting smaller and smaller as the economy of the town changed, uh, young people moved away, and the community was really shrinking for decades. So in 2010, uh, they decided to become a liberal synagogue. And they hoped that making this transformation would attract some of the British and, and Russian and American and other expats who were coming to Luxembourg for work uh, in growing numbers. Um, and unsurprisingly, this was a really contentious move. The administrative board, the consistoire, uh, and the grand rabbi, they opposed the change on religious grounds, on political grounds, um, on the grounds that this was like a huge upheaval in what had been a very traditional community. But after much debate, uh, they agreed. And so the congregation became liberal. So from 2017 until 2021, I was working in this sort of rapidly changing and complex religious landscape of Luxembourg, uh, and especially with this liberal Jewish community. Um, in particular, I was interested in how all of these issues arrived at the level of children enrolled in the liberal Jewish complementary school, uh, which I'll refer to as the LTT uh, school for, for brevity's sake. Um, I really wanted to know how students in the LTT school and their families uh, as part of this budding liberal religious community navigated a simultaneous sort of emerging secular landscape in Luxembourg. Uh, one of the things that I think is great about working with kids is that the relations and interactions between kids and adults is really this key space where social processes uh, and cultural reproduction play out in really um, explicit and deliberate ways. And I also think as sort of newcomers to the world, uh, kids are in this really intensive process of figuring out how to be in the world. Um, they're learning how to be members of their communities, of their schools. They're learning how they're supposed to relate to their friends, um, how they're the same as or different from their friends, uh, and how those you know, differences might be meaningful or important. So I think really seeing how children learn to be in the world can help us see things that we might often think of as very obvious or natural uh, or inevitable. Um, and maybe to see that those things aren't so uh, obvious, that they have to be learned. Uh, and maybe that lets us ask some new questions and consider new ways to do things. So because I, I'm an anthropologist, so really ethnography uh, is at the heart of my research. So this means that during this time, um, while I was hanging out with this community, I was really just spending time with people uh, in the sort of everyday spaces of their lives, whether that's the synagogue, uh, the LTT complementary school, their regular schools, um, their you know, social spaces, going to dinner with people, um, babysitting, you know, all of these kind of things, uh, just really spending time with people as they sort of live their everyday lives. And in this process, this sort of deep hanging out process, uh, I found out a couple of key things. So I don't have time to go into everything now, but I'll just give a little overview uh, of a couple of, I think, quite interesting things. So I think what really stood out to me and what I, what I found most interesting during my time with this community was that the LTT students spend so much time figuring out and drawing or also crossing borders. They were working to figure out the borders really of uh, modernity. What does it mean to be in the modern world of the modern world and whether and how they fit within that world uh, as Jewish children. They were figuring out the content and textures of the borders between themselves and more observant Jews. 
there was a lot of talk about juxtaposing uh, sort of liberal religious life from uh, more orthodox religious life. They were figuring out the borders of this category religion uh, and whether or maybe when and where Jewishness falls within it or doesn't. Um, they were figuring out the borders of belonging in their schools, uh, which despite having ended, you know, sort of formal things like catechism classes remain, you know, predominantly Christian. So a lot of the kids were confronted with issues like if the school has a big Christmas fair every year, that's supposed to be for everyone and everyone's supposed to participate. But then you try to talk about Hanukkah at your show and tell uh, event and your teacher asks you to quote, take the religion out of it for the classroom. What does this mean about how you belong at school? And in the process of sorting out all these borders, they're really grappling with a lot of very complex sort of paradoxes and tensions. So I think the parents of these uh, LTT students and their secular schools, they both really uh, highly valued this idea of global citizenship. And this impelled students to determine how to cultivate Jewishness uh, that's kind of transportable across time and space. And in this formulation of being open and mobile of being this kind of global citizen, someone who's not too bogged down by too many attachments and obligations, the responsibility and process of learning and carrying on Jewish tradition feels kind of paradoxical in a way. So the LTT students had to sort out how to live and think about Jewishness in a way that also allowed them to be and to see themselves as very modern and mobile uh, and liberal individuals that they wanted to be. And this was especially difficult when Judaism appeared in unexpected places like at school, uh, often in very narrow terms that didn't line up with what they were learning about how to be Jewish in Jewish spaces, like at home or, or in the synagogue. So I just wanna share one brief anecdote that I think nicely highlights some of these tensions. So most of the students join the LTT school when they're seven or eight years old. So they've already started secular school and they've already learned how to read. Uh, they've understood what reading is about, what it's for, how to be a good reader in school. It's really about comprehension. You have to understand what you're reading. Um, you have you know, reading is about abstract ideas. You can read for enjoyment or for information, some kind of like individual pursuit. But in the LTT classroom, when they learned to read liturgical Hebrew, they didn't learn to read for comprehension. And it was a really frustrating process for them. It felt like they were doing all this work. Um, you know, they were learning the alphabet, they were decoding, they were transliterating but it seemed to not be going anywhere. Uh, so during one Hebrew lesson in 2018, Adina, the Hebrew teacher uh, at the LTT school, gave each student a copy of the song Hashkedia Poracha written in Hebrew. And she asked the class to transliterate this text to write out the Hebrew sounds using Roman letters. And the class was really annoyed by it. Uh, this was a text they had seen and transliterated many times before. And now asked to transliterate it yet again, with nothing new or apparently meaningful coming out of the process, the students were really understandably frustrated. What does this even mean, uh, grumbled one student, uh, Aaron. But Adina's response didn't help. This is a song she explained about Tu Bishvat, a festival that celebrates the new year of trees and the welcoming of spring. It happens when it's still winter in Luxembourg, but in Israel, the weather's warm and the trees are already in bloom. And this is why we sing this song, even though we don't see any trees blooming right now. And one student, Moore, who had gone to a, a Jewish preschool before moving to Luxembourg and knew this song, she started to sing the song for the class. But the other students weren't going to let it go so easily. This wasn't the kind of meaning they were looking for. So when Adina turned to help another student, uh, Aaron and David turned to me to ask, again, what does the song mean? I repeated what Adina had already told them, but still not satisfied, they both groaned, oh my gosh, I thought you knew Hebrew. Adina overheard us and stepped in. She reminded the class that we're not interested in meaning right now. In fact, meaning doesn't matter at all at the moment. Instead, she wanted everyone to quote, get in the flow of reading. But this was just too much. Aggravated, Aaron exclaimed, well, I don't get it. And this back and forth, this frustration would go on for months until the students started to see Hebrew and the goal of Hebrew literacy as something very different from school literacy, which comes out of a strongly Protestant inflected legacy. 
they started to see Hebrew and being able to read liturgical Hebrew as oriented around collective performance. And really interestingly, they also started to see not understanding liturgical Hebrew as a good thing in itself. When they did encounter translations, uh, all the text kind of sounded funny to them or talked about religious things like angels or God, things they weren't sure uh, if they believed in. So not being able to understand really allowed them to sidestep these issues. And they were even discouraged from engaging with the word and sentence level of, uh, sorry, well, word and sentence level meaning of liturgy. Their parents were also happy with this arrangement. They were worried that too much study and too much God talk might make their kids more observant, which they didn't want. But being able to decode but not understand liturgical Hebrew would let them carry on tradition they felt, take part in ritual, and travel anywhere in the world they wanted to go and join a new community wherever they ended up. So over time, they really reframed literacy, what literacy is, what proficiency means, and what reading is for and why we do it in a way that resolved the paradoxical nature of wanting to be liberal and modern and carry on tradition. So they did this in a way that allowed them to do Jewishness while still fitting in and taking full part in sort of secular public life. In the bigger picture, I think what this research really strongly demonstrated is that we in Europe, and I think also probably in academia, tend to think of liberal religiosity as a way of being that supports freedom and flexibility and choice and oppose it to sort of the strongly normative, more orthodox religiosity. We reiterate a certain moral narrative of modernity where everything is or should be moving in a particular direction forward and towards some kind of you know, freedom and the idea that this is necessarily right and good. But when we really zoom in on the ways that children learn to be liberal, to be modern and to be Jewish, and what that might mean or enable or foreclose, it becomes clear that actually liberal modernity is not inevitable. It's a very deliberate project. It can also be very powerfully normative and constraining. And it can also ask us to take on certain ways of being, uh, certain desires and attachments, and it can exclude others. And I think if we can understand those ways and how they come to be, then we can ask new questions about religious lives and especially about religious difference and the management of religious difference. So currently I'm pivoting a bit more to think um, a bit to, uh, to think more specifically about uh, Jewish communities in Luxembourg and elsewhere and the ways that they relate to other religious communities. And I'm really excited to do that as part of the Cambridge Interfaith Program, uh, you know, and to work with other scholars here who are working on interfaith relations and Jewish studies. Um, I think this kind of interdisciplinary effort um, leads to really fruitful conversations and to really fruitful theoretical work as well. So that is a bit about me and my work. Thank you all for listening. And I look forward to your questions at the end. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Anastasia. That was a uh, fascinating insight into your, uh, into your research. Um, so next, uh, we have um, Dr. Vanessa Paloma Elbaz, um, who is herself of um, Moroccan Jewish uh, descent and has spent 15 years gathering, recording and archiving the musical heritage of Morocco's dwindling Jewish community. And the results of this research show how the community and Moroccan Jewish women in particular have used song for identity formation uh, and ways of conserving centuries old folk music learned in Spain um, pre-exile. Um, I should also say that Vanessa's work uh, in Morocco has recently featured very prominently uh, in an article in the New York Times, so um, do, do have a look on our uh, website and our Twitter feed for uh, um, more about uh, Vanessa's work. Um, Vanessa, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Giles, and everyone. It's great to be here um, and to talk about our the shared connections kind of larger methodologically and our specific um, projects. So I'll share my screen here. Um, and so what I thought was so interesting about what Anastasia was talking about is that it, this issue of, um, of repeating um, 
repeating rituals without necessarily knowing what it means, but having that framework of repetition, of sonic repetition and, and, and textual repetition is such an important part of the way that, that Jewish life is in that community, but it also actually is very important in the Moroccan Jewish community because um, one of the issues that I look at is this uh, is music ritual thought belief, but in the in the use of repetition and repetitive devices, which are uh, textual, which are gestural at times, which are melodic as well and rhythmic. And I think that these four elements are actually interweave in um, in a, a kind of what I call kind of like a mechanisms and technologies of transmission, which which actually help to embed and embody uh, the knowledge of of the local community, but also of what it is to to be a Jew in the world. Um, and a lot of what it is to be a Jew in the world is to uh, know how to sing certain things or to sing certain things at the right time and in the right context. Um, so I want to just make you hear two of the different voices. So I actually, I look at women's and men's performances because in the Moroccan context and in a lot of the more traditional uh, communities that, that I study are, um, they're quite separate from each other in the repertoire. So the men are more often singing uh, religious liturgical repertoire or public facing secular repertoire. And the women will be singing uh, uh, repertoires that are more related to the life cycle and to the home and paraliturgical repertoires in in uh, familial spaces, which have to do with um, networks of genealogy and and family transmission. So I want you first to hear um, Alegria Benjou from Casablanca. <laughs> Que nuestros iguales ya las tienen tejida, ya las tienen tejida. Y tú la mi nuera, tapada y dormida. So here, this is in Judeo-Spanish, right? It's in a Moroccan haketia, which is a Moroccan Judeo-Spanish that includes words of um, of Moroccan derija, of colloquial Arabic, Hebrew, and the, the largest space is Spanish. And because of the Spanish protectorate, which was between 1912 and um, 1956, there is uh, a lot of, it, it became much more Hispanized. Um, the other example is Yaakov Wiesman, who was the last student of Rabbi David Buzaglo, if any of you know your paraliturgical repertoire from Morocco. Uh, so he's a, he's kind of the last recipient of the great lineage of, of liturgical song. And you'll hear the, the way that his voice, it's a lot more ornamented and, um, and he sings in a voice that's more performative, that's, more, that's a lot less intimate and more for a large audience. So what I want to talk about is this issue of performance spaces. So there's there are many boundaries around what is the repertoire, where is it sung, and who sings it, and for what uh, for what purpose. So uh, this table here, which if we had more time, we would look at it and discuss it a lot uh, more in depth. But here it gives you a sense of we have this public exo group 
um, set of, of things that exist today, only recently, I would say in the last 40 years, which are public concerts, radio, television, and there's a lot of music and films about Jews that have been made in the last 15 years. And then there's public endo group, which is more the, the synagogue literature, liturgy, life cycle parties. The schools are very important. So they have uh, performances in schools and, or for maybe Purim for certain Jewish holidays that have a performative aspect. They'll do a, a performance, a public performance, but only for, for the group. And performances at pilgrimages, which are very, very important in Moroccan Judaism, as the, the photograph that was used for this event um, showed. And then um, you have this private mixed gender, which is more within families or within groups that that will know each other more. Uh, so singing while preparing matzah, which is something that used to happen actually um, until I would say the 1970s or so, they would gather and they would prepare the the, the matzah for Passover and be singing together as they're baking it and rolling it and doing all these, this very gestural aspect also because the idea was that as they sang, there were certain songs that one would sing for the preparation of, of ritual foods. And the, the intention in the song was crucial because it was supposed to go into the food and, and then be ingested by the people. So there's a there's a cycle um, that goes out of the mouth into the food and back into the mouth to, to kind of imbue the soul on another level. Uh, and then we have, of course, the singing at uh, um, in the home, for example, for the reading of the Passover Haggadah or for Shabbat, um, sometimes private home concerts and singing in more enclosed spaces like pilgrimage, uh, a pilgrimage bus or a, now these is in recent years since since the buses have been happening but before it could have been on a carriage uh on a pilgrimage carriage and then we have the private separate gender which are the very ritually charged moments where sound uh has a function really and song has a function to really kind of uh, embed the the recipient of it with bracha, with baraka, with blessing. Um, so there's the the songs that are sung during the the bride's ritual bath before the wedding that the older postmenopausal women sing to the young bride to imbue her with fertility for the whole community. There are home based women's gatherings. There's also quotidian music making as they're doing things around the home. Um, and there are also songs during labor to help the laboring mother um, give birth and to and to bring forth the, the child. Um, I, I have actually recently put up a, a platform about some of these songs in Judeo-Arabic that are specifically sung uh, for for birth, uh, and one of them is actually a song that should be sung to the bride when her water breaks. So really, there are um, there there are moments that are very very specific and things that happen only once or twice in a person's life. But there is the repertoire there to support that moment. Um, then the next slide takes us to um, these this idea though also of then what happens when they're in this exo group situation? So there are these, these punctuated moments uh, that enact relations of power that the men will often do in, in these public spaces. So in relation to the palace, in relation to Jewish festivities or diplomats, there's a lot of performance of Jewish music for the diplomatic corps um, in, in Morocco as part of the Moroccan um, public diplomacy about their their uh, openness and and tolerance and diversity within the country, also in relation to civil society, because there's a, a push towards towards this uh, language of diversity in a way to counter um, extremism, and and there's also uh, 
active relationship of performance to the Jewish diaspora. So the, the, the rest of the Jews all around the world that want to listen to Moroccan Jewish music. Um, and the women's songs are more uh, divided. They'll, they'll know some of the liturgical songs to connect to sanctification. Uh, many of them sing romances or songs that tell stories that are usually relating to group boundaries. So that's topics about adultery or um, incest or kidnapping issues about moving in or out of certain uh, very strict societal norms. And then there are the songs that are um, for fertility of, of the couple. And, but it's of the couple, but it's actually really for the community as a whole. And in these rituals of fertility, we see uh, that there's a, a special ritual dress that the bride wears that has uh, that puts her as the the Torah scroll. So the bride becomes the body of the what was supposed to be traditionally and today maybe for some is is the body of the virgin bride. Then becomes this the Torah scroll, the Itz Chaim, the tree of life, which has then is surrounded by all these symbols of uh, cosmology, the moon, which is the female, and the sun, which is the male, supposedly, and then the trees and the birds and a, a whole series of, uh, of mystical, but also cosmological um, metaphors that are actually placed on the body of the bride to imbue her with, uh, with the, the needed fertility. Um, then we have a figure such as Salim Halali, which is a superstar in Morocco and in the Arab world. And, um, but he plays this very interesting role because it, he sings a song, Rjal Bladik, Go Back to Your Land, that he's singing to the Muslims who have left for Europe. But then he's saying your land. And then this photograph that you see to the left, which is actually uh, from the sound archive, which I've uh, started and is a, not a public photograph, has him singing at an Israel Independence Day with Herzl and, um, and the flag of Israel behind him. And this would not be shown in traditional uh, Moroccan spaces. So, so they're, they're negotiating these, these various aspects. And this is actually the, what I find so interesting because it's this, this constant negotiation between the inside and the outside. Uh, and while all of them are simultaneously a crucial part to the life of these Jews as individuals, as members of larger extended families, and then, of course, as members of the larger community. Um, and I think I will stop there because even though I had a video to play for you, um, we are running out of time. So if we have time later, we can listen to it. Thank you so very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for that wonderful um, presentation, such fascinating uh, uh, work that you're uh, uh, allowing us to peek into. Um, so finally, uh, today we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Daniel Weiss. Um, Daniel is um, a Polonsky Coexist uh, Senior Lecturer in Jewish Studies uh, here in Cambridge, although he is on sabbatical at the moment uh, and joining us from uh, Tübingen, uh, where he's um, based. And he at the moment is reinvestigating um, evidence about early rabbinic attitudes to the Jesus movement and uh, to Christianity. Um, this work brings together um, some of his training in philosophy and texts um, and is supported uh, by a Humboldt Research Fellowship uh, in Tübingen. Um, Daniel, I'll uh, hand over to you. Great, thanks very much, Giles. <clears throat> so yes, uh, as Giles said, um, this is actually part of my current research. Uh, and it's uh, we've heard uh, just now about elements of uh, uh, Jewish communities in Europe, Jewish communities in North Africa. Now we'll be moving to the Middle East, uh, but we'll also be moving back in time to the third century uh, CE. Uh, so if I could have the next slide, please. Yeah, so the, to give a, a basic overview of the my current research, uh, we can uh, note that oftentimes today, uh, we find some people might assume that attitudes of religious tolerance 
are more, something that's a more modern development. And particularly when it comes to relations between rabbinic Judaism and Christianity, there is often an assumption of a continuous history of conflict and mutual hostility, maybe uh, interspersed or with some changes uh, in certain parts of the modern period, uh, but uh, often assumed to be mutual hostility. And uh, so scholars have already shown it's, it's uh, clear that we have various uh, texts in Christian tradition from the second and third centuries in which one finds a negative attitude expressed towards Judaism. And so scholars have frequently assumed that rabbinic Judaism, the, uh, the stream of uh, Judaism that develops starting from the, especially the third century onward and becomes the dominant form of uh, Judaism as practiced in different Jewish communities today. Uh, scholars have assumed that rabbinic Judaism likewise viewed followers of Jesus in an equally negative way during the same time period in the third century. And this assumption has often gone along with assumptions that these rabbinic groups uh, viewed other Jews more generally who are not part of the rabbinic movement more negatively as well. Uh, but what my recent research has uh, is uh, working to show is that it seems that uh, these third century rabbinic texts, these earliest uh, rabbinic collections, actually do not express an inherently negative, negative attitude towards non-rabbinic Jews. And surprisingly, this attitude of tolerance also seems like it may have included Jesus followers, uh, so that many topics associated with the Jesus movement do not appear to have evoked negative responses for the authors of the rabbinic texts. And this even includes uh, topics such as claims that the Messiah has already come or the idea of calling somebody son of God. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, it may be that these assumptions of a mutual two-way hostility between Judaism and Christianity during this time period, this time period need to be fundamentally rethought. And furthermore, we'll see that uncovering these more tolerant attitudes in these uh, Middle Eastern early rabbinic texts can have significant implications for conflicts today, uh, both say between different groups within Jewish communities, uh, as well as relations between Jews and members of other religious traditions. So, uh, and what we'll be looking at today, uh, so I fir I'll first talk about uh, this, uh, the, the general topic, how did early rabbis relate to these others? The first topic I'll look at is the Am Ha'aretz, which we'll see is the uh, a general term uh, used in a wide range of rabbinic texts. Uh, and that's often been assumed to uh, reference uh, Jews who are not part of the smaller rabbinic group. Uh, the term literally means people of the land. And so people have assumed it to mean sort of the, the, the rest of the Jews, the general uh, rest of the Jews apart from the specific rabbinic group. So we'll look at uh, attitudes of the rabbinic text towards this figure of the Am Ha'aretz. Uh, and then we'll uh, build on that and look at uh, attitudes towards the Jesus movement in particular. And I use the term Jesus movement here rather than Christianity, uh, because this is the term that's uh, frequently used in scholarship for the uh, early uh, centuries of the movement that eventually became Christianity. Uh, that uh, scholars have said it was, uh, it started off as a movement within Judaism uh, and later became something, a more separated movement that then uh, subsequently called Christianity. Uh, and what we'll see is interesting is that these rabbinic texts from the third century, uh, it's already been a couple hundred years of the Jesus movement being around. There would have been chance, a chance for much more hostility to develop. Uh, we see uh, various negative attitudes from Christian texts in this time period, but we will see actually that the uh, the rabbinic texts themselves may have upheld a more tolerant attitude. So uh, next slide, please. So, the, so first for the uh, looking at the Am Ha'aretz. So I want to first uh, name uh, uh, four common scholarly assumptions about the rabbinic relation to this Am Ha'aretz figure, the non-rabbinic Jew. And uh, we'll see that a lot of these assumptions are actually uh, drawn primarily from uh, later rabbinic texts, say from the fifth or sixth century onward. 
Uh, and many scholars have assumed that they also apply to these early third century texts, uh, especially so, and the third century texts, just to name the ones that uh, would be most prominent, the Mishnah is the uh, uh, most central of these third century uh, collections. We also have the collection called the Tosefta and collections of uh, Midrashic interpretation, uh, early rabbinic interpretation of scriptural texts. Uh, but so if we look at these third century texts, uh, scholars have come, often come to them with the assumption, uh, what is the Am Haaretz in the eyes of the rabbis, these non-rabbinic Jews? Uh, scholars have assumed that uh, in the rabbinic view, uh, the Am Haaretz is someone who does not observe the commandments the way that the rabbis think that they ought to be observed. Uh, so it's someone who's uh, less observant. And, you know, we can think today of uh, potential conflicts between different Jewish groups uh, some who are more observant, some who are less observant, and how do they view one another? So there's been an assumption of the Amha Aretz doesn't observe commandments, the rabbinic group does, and therefore that's, uh, the rabbinic group might look down on the Amha Aretz for that reason. Uh, another assumption is that the Amha Aretz is assumed to be ignorant of Torah, of uh, religious learning. Uh, and this, again, uh, these two uh, elements combined uh, go along with the scholarly assumption that they think that the rabbis uh, look down upon the Amharits, view the Amharits negatively because of their lack of observance and their supposed ignorance. Uh, and they, uh, scholars also assume that the rabbis position themselves then as the other from the Amharits. We are the more observant, the learned group. The Amharits is uh, non-observant and is ignorant. Uh, and so one thing that my research uh, is uncovering is actually, if we look at the third century texts, we don't see this negative attitude towards the Amha Aretz that we find in later rabbinic texts. Uh, rather, the early rabbinic texts uh, do talk about the Amha Aretz, but first of all, it actually doesn't seem to mean somebody who is uh, non-observant of commandments uh, or as someone who is ignorant of Torah. Uh, and that the in, in many cases, and this is the even more surprising part, uh, many of the rabbinic figures uh, may group themselves in the Amha Aretz category, and they, you know, and uh, don't create this sharp divide between their group and the other groups. Uh, and so the this this uh, really uh, overturns a lot of assumptions about the rabbinic group as being a group that looks negatively at people outside their circles, uh, and instead it creates a picture of the rabbinic group as actually uh, operating within the broader Jewish community. Uh, and not everybody is a member of this specific rabbinic group who engages in certain study practices, uh, but the rabbinic group sees itself as uh, uh, not separated from the rest of the Jewish community, uh, doesn't see its own observance or level of observance as different from necessarily from people who aren't part of the rabbinic group, doesn't view people who aren't part of the rabbinic movement as inherently ignorant of Torah, uh, it's it's a much more integrated and less separationist uh, attitude towards these supposed others. Uh, so next slide, please. Right. So and, and uh, this uh, attitude of rethinking the rabbinic attitude towards the generally the rest of the Jewish community also helps uh, us for uh, rethinking attitudes towards uh, of the rabbinic movement towards the Jesus. Uh, the rabbinic, these rabbinic texts towards the Jesus movement. Uh, and just to give a couple examples briefly here, uh, people would often assume that these rabbinic texts would have a negative attitude towards uh, claims that the Messiah has already come, for instance. Uh, people assume that, uh, you know, the rabbinic texts uh, uh, would condemn people who say the Messiah has come or claims within a, a group of claiming a figure, a certain a human being to be the son of God. And what's interesting uh, is uh, if we look more closely at the rabbinic texts, we actually find that they don't seem to have a negative attitude towards claims that the Messiah has already come. Uh, it seems more so to be a situation where uh, the, the rabbinic texts themselves may not say that the Messiah has already come, but they may position themselves actually to remain in, trying to remain in good relation, uh, both to Jews who say the Messiah has already come and to Jews who say the Messiah hasn't. And the rabbinic texts themselves can be seen as taking uh, not deliberately not taking a stance on that type of issue, uh, that type of divisive issue, 
uh, and saying this is something uh, a question that uh, we don't need to take a stance on uh, and by the 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 conscious uh, act of not taking a stance it allows them actually to remain in good relation to a wider range of people within the Jewish community uh, likewise notions of claims about the son of God uh, people have assumed that uh, because Christianity uh, the Jesus movement says Jesus is the son of God people have assumed that one would find a negative reaction uh, to this in rabbinic text of saying, no, uh, we don't say that any human being is the son of God. Uh, and this is actually something one does find in later Judaism in creating more of a oppositional relation to Christianity. But actually these third century rabbinic texts don't seem to take a negative attitude towards the notion of describing a human being as a son of God. Uh, and in fact, what we find instead is that they extend the notion of son of God to all Israelites, all members of the Jewish community. Uh, so a text from Pirkei Avot, uh, uh, one of these early rabbinic texts, uh, described, says that actually all Israelites are called the sons of God, uh, citing uh, Deuteronomy 14.1, where uh, Moses says to the Israelites, uh, you are uh, sons to the Lord your God. Uh, so in a certain sense, if the Jesus movement said uh, that Jesus is the son of God, we could see these early rabbinic texts as saying, oh, yes, definitely Jesus is the son of God, as are all other Israelites. So uh, not affirming the uh, Christian position in the way it uh, might be asserted in that Christian context, but not negating it either, uh, but instead taking, a, you could say, a more conciliatory approach of a uh, seeking to re retain certain types of tolerant relations. And so what it, what it turns out is the rabbinic attitudes uh, towards the Jesus movement, the, if, uh, the degree that negative attitudes arise, arise primarily not from uh, the Jesus movement taking various uh, theological stances, uh, but more so uh, towards the Jesus movement uh, or some elements of the Jesus movement moving towards separatist attitudes of wanting to separate from the broader Jewish community to say that the broader Jewish community is now condemned by God. So the uh, rabbinic texts don't mind theological diversity, uh, but they uh, do dislike um, uh, groups that would separate from the broader Jewish community and condemn the broader Jewish community in the way that some Christian groups do. Uh, and so uh, one uh, uh, way of looking at uh, the results of uh, my research is to say we shouldn't generalize about the Jesus movement or Christianity vis-a-vis -vis rabbinic Judaism. Uh, it might be that if we say, look at different texts in the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of John might be viewed negatively by uh, these rabbinic texts, not because of what it says about Jesus, but because of its separatist attitude and its negative comments about the Jews. Uh, whereas if we look at other texts from the New Testament, uh, so to take one example of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, uh, uh, it may be the case that the rabbinic text would not see uh, that uh, form of the Jesus movement in particularly negative terms. So rather than generalizing, we need to look at uh, these specific subgroups. And when we do so, we, we find that uh, we have a situation where the uh, we find the rabbinic text actually expressing much more tolerance of diversity of religious practice and of diversity of differing religious belief uh, than we might have assumed. And this is something then I think uh, uncovering this in the third century and reflecting on what type of uh, group dynamics are displayed in these rabbinic texts can help us for thinking about new ways of thinking of interreligious relations in the present day as well. So I'll stop there. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Um, can I ask our other panelists to um, turn their cameras back on and uh... Uh, now we can move into a brief session of Q&A. So um, if you have a, a question for um, uh, any one of our panelists or indeed for all of them, please do um, uh, type that into the Q&A box and we will uh, gather those together and I can then feel some of those. Um, meanwhile, to get going, just in the interest of time, rather than having you cross-examine one another, as it were, I thought I'd, I'd pose a more general question to all of you and then see who, who would like to uh, to take it. So one of the things that's come out in each of your uh, talks is the um, relations between um, within communities and then uh, from within that community to 
another community, uh, often a, a, a society of which they're part or, or, or another movement. Um, and so, so I suppose just sort of reflecting more broadly on Jewish studies as a field, if, if, if it is a field um, in, 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 in each of your work, I, I just wonder whether you see this question of engaging with the boundaries of the not Jewish um, as a key part of um, um, Jewish studies or, or not, and, and, and to what extent is this a, um, a scholarly choice? So I'll just leave that large question with you while we gather questions. Thank you. I'll jump in quickly and just say that um, I think it's a very interesting way of engaging with the issue of, of Jewish studies because it cuts across so many of the different disciplinary silos that, that scholars are in. So you can see the issue of boundaries through history, anthropology, sound, you know, all sorts of uh, the, this is the constant neg negotiation. However, I would I would um, make a caveat that um, it's actually also very interesting to to look at issues that are not dealing with boundaries as well. So, great, Thank you. Anastasia. Did you... Oh, yeah. I was I was just going to add. I mean, I think um, I also think it's really crucial that we sort of attend to maybe not just boundaries, but Jewish and non-Jewish relations. I think um, just in the sense that uh, no community exists in, in a little, in a bubble, you know, no, none of this stuff is happening in sort of isolation. So I think it is important that we attend to those kind of relations, um, but maybe it's a scholarly choice as to how directly we do that. Is that sort of what we're focusing on or are we focusing on something else and that's sort of a, a contextual piece of, of what we're doing um, I think that maybe depends on on what you're looking at and, and what kind of research you're doing sure no I can just add briefly that yeah I, I think it's a it's a really good point and the question of is Jewish studies a field uh, I think is is important especially because you know in so many Jewish contexts uh the the way in which Jewish community are especially at, at, as minority groups have been shaped by the surrounding culture, by interaction with their surrounding culture, positive, negative, uh, all sorts of types of interrelation, but that you could say that, uh, right, in order to study Jewish studies and, and the topic, do you actually have to know much more outside of Jewish studies per se? That I th And I think that's in all the presentations we've seen today, uh, it's, uh, you know, you could say it's almost impossible to study Jewish study, Jew Jewish communities in some ways, uh, in isolation and you know maybe that could be true of other fields as well but i think there's there's something uh notably you know distinctive with this the study of judaism in that regard great yeah that's that's really interesting um so we have a question uh from the audience which i shall um, mediate uh if, if that's okay um and uh, um it's put in sort of fairly general terms so i will just pose it as such is the question about um jewish converts and conversion uh, to judaism and whether that features at all in your research, what kind of um, difference that might make to the way that you um, frame things or think about them. And so I just... Was there a more specific uh, no, question? No, or... no, the question about Jewish converts, that, that, it, it is that general, but... Uh... Okay, sure. I'll very quickly talk about, um, in Morocco, actually, the conversion issue became, it's, a, it's very important because as a, uh, a Jewish minority of a Muslim population, where for the Jews, the uh, the the Orthodox traditional Jews, a, the line goes down through the mother, and in Muslim law, it goes down through the father. You could actually conceivably have um, a child that is both, right? Um, and that is, but legally in the country, because the law is actually Muslim law, so a a Mus the child of a Muslim father is considered Muslim and not Jewish by the Jewish instances in Morocco. However, outside of Morocco, they are not. They can they are considered Jewish um, and maybe somewhat quietly inside of the, the Moroccan place they would. So but then there's the issue of conversion, which they would not accept in the other direction. Right. So a Jew, a, a Muslim man is not allowed uh, either Muslim man or 
or Muslim woman is not allowed to convert into Judaism in Morocco. It's illegal. Um, and they had, during the protectorate, they had a lot of um, conversion um, until actually the daughter, the some black child woman came to Morocco to get converted. Um, and it turns out that I guess she wasn't the kind of perfect kind of candidate convert that the rabbinics in Europe wanted. And so the, there was a, a kind of a dynamic between the international Jewish rabbinical community and the Moroccan rabbinical community, and they shut down the conversions in Morocco. So it's a it's very interesting, and, and it has to do with these gender relations and these relations of transmission, basically. That's fascinating. Thank you. The, um, the question has been somewhat slightly more specified for you, Daniel. I don't know if you can see this, but I shall um, I'll ask it. So this is about recent Jewish converts in the second century and how your findings, do your findings relate equally to these groups within the Jesus movements? Um, asking from within uh, the context of the so-called Odes of Solomon, Christian Odes of Solomon, which is considered uh, to be written by a Jewish convert to Christianity. Or you just need to unmute. Thank you. Uh, no, that's a good question. I mean, I think this, the, uh, the it's a very good question about, you know, we have uh, Jewish converts to Christianity. Uh, and uh, there's sometimes a phrase that's used in history about the Jewish Christians. Uh, but this is a, has been called into question in recent scholarship as how useful a term it is. And I think it's, uh, it, there's usually the, the notion of, uh, uh, if, uh, if they say a Jew in the first or second century joined the Jesus movement, are they treated as uh, a convert uh, to a different religion uh, or not? And I think what's one thing that uh, my current research might raise, I, I need to think about it more, is whether it seems to be that the case that these rabbinic texts don't seem to view someone, um, uh, what you could call a, a converting, joining the Jesus movement as having any particular significance. They don't see that as a, a major change. Uh, but they, what they would see as a major change is if someone joined a form of the Jesus movement that was condemning the broader Jewish community uh, or that separated from the broader Jewish community. So this, uh, uh, in this case, the question of uh, whether someone counts as a convert in, you know, in undergoing a major religious change would not be about the theological views they affirm per se, but about the, the social stance they take uh, whether they separate from the community or not. So I, I think it raises different questions of how we then analyze uh, some of these texts written that are thought to be written by Jewish converts or not. So anyway, that's a bit, uh, it's a good question. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, there are more questions coming in and they are all fascinating. I'm afraid we are two minutes from being uh, cruelly cut off. Uh, and so um, I, I must for now begin to, to, to draw things to a close. But um, I think the interest is such that we might well uh, put our heads together and think about some kind of follow up event, actually, because I think there could be some really interesting continuing uh, conversations coming out of this. Um, so just before I uh, thank our contributors, just uh, to point you to some of the upcoming activities um, from the Cambridge Interfaith Programme, we have uh, an exhibition coming this autumn during UK Interfaith Week, that's the 13th to the 20th of November, on uh, shared sacred uh, spaces and landscape, uh, as well as um, our project on scripture and violence, uh, which will be launching in uh, early in the new year. Um, so uh, do look to our website and our Twitter feed uh, uh, for more information about that. Uh, and um, let me thank our, our panelists, uh, Dr. Vanessa Paloma Elbaz, Dr. Daniel Weiss, and Dr. Anastasia uh, Bader for your wonderful uh, and very thought provoking uh, presentations. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.